replete with so many different things. And, you know, if you ever if you ever just take the time to... How many of y'all just read your Bible through sometimes and just kind of read it to be reading it? There's a place for that. There really is. But there's another place for reading it very, very slowly and just chewing it apart. Has anybody ever done that? Where you just take the time to take your Bible and say, you know, I'm going to spend some time in the Word. You know, 1 Timothy 3.16 is very clear. It says we need to rightly divide the Word of truth. And this is my favorite line. If it can be rightly divided, it it can also be wrongly divided, right? And so there is no greater battle that we face than making sure the Word of God is what? Right. Amen. Because I guarantee you, everybody you talk to, somebody says their way is the right way, right? Amen. I've been, and, and it takes a while. You know, you've got to learn how to pick things apart. You know, I, I've learned a long time ago now, when, you, when you're a child and you drink, you drink a lot of milk and you drink a lot of formula, right? You drink a lot of uh, things of that nature because you can't handle hard foods. But as you get older, uh, you're able to eat certain foods. Now, when I was younger, I found it. Uh, and, and not so much now, I don't know why that is, but when I was younger, I had to be careful when I ate steak or ate anything that was of a tougher type of meat when I was younger. Because it seemed like I, I'd always try to swallow more than I could chew, you know, and I'd find myself, I've almost choked myself to death a couple of times when I was younger. But as i got gotten older, I've learned how to smaller portion it to eat it to where I don't choke myself on it, amen, and try to bite off more than I can chew. Amen. And so uh, I don't know if that's an age thing or what, amen, but I, I do know this much, that when you are tackling things in Scripture, it is wise to take it one bite at a time and not try to bite off more than you can chew. I know many folks, and I, I've said this before, I remember when I was down jail ministry one time, there was a young man, uh, and he was probably in his early 30s, he had come down there and he said that uh, he was going to be pastor in a Baptist church real soon. He wanted to help. We, you know, he wasn't going to teach doctrine. We weren't going to let him do any of that. But, uh, and I'm not sure he even knew what the doctrine was, if you want to know the truth. And, uh, he, but he, but he, he could, he could be a help, help us sing. And we'd even let him, you know, take a scripture and just kind of say something about the scripture. You know. And so we allowed him to do that down to jail with us, and uh, just kind of get his feet wet and this stuff. And we, of course, we were working on him and talking to him here and there. And, uh, but he said, you know, he said, uh, uh, he said. I think you were kind of hard on him on there today. So he told me. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're, you were talking about sin, and they ought not be drinking no more, smoking no more, and they ought not be taking them that heroin and drugs and stuff. Well, actually, it was crack back in them days. Amen. He says, not be doing that stuff anymore and get thrown in jail. He said, you can't, you know, he said, you got, you got to talk love and peace and, and nice. And I said, I said, apparently you read a different book than I read. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, you can't live with infection. I said, sooner or later, infection will destroy you. I said, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the infection before you can heal the body. I said, you know, I, I, and I kind of went back, like I was alluded to here last, I think it was uh, Wednesday I was talking, uh, and, and I was saying that, you know, when I was in the military, one thing they do is they break you down first so then they can build you up. You know, the preaching of God's Word, and it's so vital that we understand this, the preaching of God's Word, amen, is not designed to build you up. What, Brother D? It's not. The preaching of God's Word is to take out all that stuff that's in you and get it out of you. I'm talking the bad things that can be in you, amen. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the term bad things, amen. But things that, amen, that's why the Bible says the Word of God, it goes right to the marrow, it says, even, even to the bone. In other words, it gets right down to the very heart of it. Anybody know what the marrow of the bone does? Where's where some of my nurses in that around here? I know you all know this stuff. What's that? That's right. It produces blood, but it also produces something else. You want to know what that is? Amen. The bone is where everything is that that becomes, amen, is made out of the base. In other words, when it comes from the when it first comes from the bone, amen. Uh, uh, the I think they call them B cells for bone cells. I think that's what they call it for when you get a B cell and you've heard T cell or B cell. A B cell means it comes from the bone. A T cell means it comes from the thyroid. I don't know if you all knew that or not, but if you ever had cancer, you learn these things. Learn more than you ever wanted to. Amen. But uh, uh, but when it comes from the bone, amen, it's the foundation amen, that things come from is in the bone. That's what the Bible said. You get down to the very root of things. You get down to the preaching will take it right to the bone. Preaching takes things right to the bone. 
And so if you don't preach at it, amen, you'll never get rid of it. That's why the Bible says they, that the folks in the last day are going to want to have teachers, not preachers. They want teachers having itching ears. In other words, just be nice and don't say anything mean. Don't say anything offensive. Don't say anything at all. Right? Just be nice. And see, sometimes that works even when, when, when you're trying to help somebody, you're trying to comfort somebody. That's not a place to go preaching at. There is a place where you just need to comfort. But there is a place, amen, for the preaching of the Word, amen, to where it gets out anything and everything that could possibly be, 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 be uh, something not needed in you and removes it from you. That's why there's a difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching is an exhortation. As preachers should exhort. Preachers should not, you, you should not hear preaching sound like teaching. It should not be teaching. Preaching, you should, you should have a breathless response. When they get done, they should be, I don't know if they should be sweating or not, but they, I, they should work themselves up to a good froth. How about that? Amen. But preaching is designed because it's, it's literally giving all of yourself to someone, amen, through God's Word and making sure it goes forth in such a way that it impacts someone in such a way, amen, that it removes the things. You know, Anybody heard the expression, why are you yelling at me? You ever done that? You ever do that at your house with your kid? But you ever have kids go, why are you yelling at me? You're ruining my life. I guess you, oh, well, you got a boy, Travis. He won't say that. Amen. But the girls, they have a tendency to use this comment. You're ruining my life. What? <laughs> Kylie, she'll get... <laughs> I yell on occasion at my house. I do. I'm, I'm honest. I, I try not to yell. I really. I don't walk around just looking to, looking for reasons to yell. I don't look around. I don't walk around my house and go walk in the living room and go. I want to yell today. Come here, child. I want to yell at you. The reason we tend to yell is because somebody ain't listening. If someone don't listen, you feel like you have to raise your voice and have an octave for them to hear you. And that's why folks have a tendency to yell. Amen. Matter of fact, Kylie told me one time. <laughs> she said she wanted to grow up just like me so she could get to yell at people. Amen. <laughs> I said, I'm not yelling at people, Kylie. <laughs> We're preaching, honey. She said, well, if that's what you call preaching, I call yelling. She said. <laughs> but uh, I... Uh, uh, but. You know, when we, when we talk to people, we preach to people, you know, our, our whole goal and our whole purpose is not just to remove sin, amen, but it does break us down to a level that God can work with. That's why preaching is designed to go to what's called the apostleship realm or the realm where the base is. There's lots of the Bible says there is no other foundation that can be laid except for what? Jesus Christ, right? It's the only, that's why the most basis of our preaching must be salvation must be salvation. That's why most of our Sunday messages are going to be based on salvation. If you hear us talk about repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, belief, faith, all of these things are designed because they are the very foundation of who we are. And sometimes, I don't, I, has anyone ever owned a home where, where, where you get cracks in your, in your foundation? You get cracks in the concrete? You get crack, and you have to put crack sealant in it? Because even foundations can get cracked. You know, the elements of this world will come along and they'll beat on that foundation. And sometimes you get to your church and you think, that's all we ever preach on is Acts 2.38 around here. Because we're supposed to. Now, if you come Wednesday night where we teach more, you'll find you get a lot more teaching. But if you only come on Sunday, you're probably only going to get a bunch of constant preaching about some form of Acts 2.38. Can I be honest with you? Every message I've ever preached on a Sunday... I always gear it no matter what it is. Somehow I'm going to work in repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, speaking of the tongue, the Spirit of God gives the utterance, living a holy life before God. It's going to be there every single time, and you will get sick of it. But I will not stop preaching it that way, because you have to constantly redo the foundation to make sure, amen, uh, now, the Apostle Paul said we need to leave the foundations of principles of God. We need to learn how to, because he was talking about teaching at that point. We have to move on from doctrines of baptism. He said we have to move on from all of these different things. He said, why? He said, because he said, we, we want to do more than just preach. We also want to teach. Teaching is just as vital as preaching. 
It is. It's just as important as pre- we now listen, the hallmark of our faith is 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 the anointed preaching, and folks are used to that. Now, there are a lot of churches that teach good stuff. You hear me? They do. There's I, I don't I'm not gonna sit here and tell you every church teaches something horrible. It doesn't. Sometimes they teach very good things. Okay? But the reality of it is that most of our teaching should be based upon building up the body of Christ. Amen. And so if uh, most of our teaching on Wednesday is designed that way. We're not preaching Acts 2.38 messages usually on Wednesday night. Usually we're teaching some something uh, either out of a lesson plan or something we're going to do even to try to build up your most holy faith. Because why? There's a lot of things in this book. There are 66 things in this Bible. There's 66 books. There's a whole lot to teach about and preach about. There are 12 major doctrines in the Bible itself. Could you imagine taking one thing, just one doctrine, and spending just... Two or three months just to teach one doctrine? I mean, that's why you don't always get to the book of... Everybody always wants to go to the book of Revelation all the time and stay there. Let's never move. Let's just go to the book. But, you know, uh, it's funny. We were talking one time, and as I asked somebody one time, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, now, why is it... I said, I could ask you what being slain in the Spirit is, and you'll know what that is. Folks know terms like being slain in the Spirit. You know? They, they, they know terms like that. I said, but you, if I ask you what appropriation is, you don't know what that is. Yet that's what's in the Bible, slain in the Spirit. I said, you'll never find one terminology where slain in the Spirit is even in the Bible. Oh, Brother D, that's what we Pentecostals do. No, that's just terminology you use. But the Bible talks about appropriation. It talks about glorification. It talks about justification. It talks about sanctification. All the occasions. But we want to take a vacation for the occasions. Right? And talk about, well, you were slain as very, you really got blessed tonight. Well, what's that supposed to mean? You did what you're supposed to do already. That's what church is supposed to be all about. You see, some folks take their experience and base it whole life based upon their experience and never get to the doctrine of God. We need to, that's why Paul said we got to move on from just, you know, there's nothing wrong with Acts 2.38. It needs to be preached, continue to be preached. But we need to start teaching and understand you need to be here for some teaching of the Word of God. That's why we have Sunday morning here also to teach. Amen. Because it's important that you receive some teaching. Amen. And that's why, you know, when I look at this Word of God, and, and, and we talk about treating sometimes from up here, I know, but we, we talk about different things. But I, and I'm, I, I'm trying to teach you about preaching and teaching right now, which I know is kind of a silly thing to do. But I don't know if people know the difference sometimes. There is a difference. Amen. I, I can't tell you how many so-called preachers that I hear, because some folks think that everything needs to be preached. Not everything needs to be preached. Some things need to be taught. Amen. Praise God. I, 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 don't, I don't preach as a general rule. I don't, I don't preach standards from a platform. I teach them. But I don't preach them. In other words, I may allude to them, but it doesn't mean I'm going to sit there and give you a chapter, a verse, reason and why. Amen? Because those things are done in a teaching platform. You know, I, and I think I mentioned this last, last week. I said, but I, I want to mention it again here today. You know, when Moses first uh, came out of Egypt, when he brought the people, because we know that coming out of Egypt is a type of leaving sin. Amen? Going through the Red Sea is a type of water baptism, you know, and then, him going up to the Mount Sinai to receive the tablets of the law was a type of the filling of the Holy Ghost that was to come because of burning fire, burning bush, you know what I mean, cloven tongues of fire, you know, the whole, uh, whole typology. I said, but I said, you'll notice that after his baptism or going through the Red Sea, he did not have his tablet there yet. The tables of stone were not in his hand. And I know some folks, and I'm, and, and, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to pastors around here, whoever they may be, that when they come in the door, they're already trying to get folks cha- clothing, chains, and everything else. Amen. And I mean, I'm telling you what. I mean, I've seen them do it. I mean, I've literally seen them do it. Get frustrated because you know they come in wearing hot pants or something, and you know, they, and, you know they're like, you can't wear that in here. Well, why not? They're sinners. It's what they do. And you can't, you can't, you can't throw the Bible at them yet. <laughs> Amen. And you, you know what you do? You have to preach that out, that spirit out. But you don't preach it in what they're doing. Amen. You preach to the sin. Not to the person. You preach to the sin, not to the individual. I'm not going to come up to you and say, Thou shalt do it this way or else. 
But if you preach to the sin, you'll find that that sin has to, has to, <laughs> it has to hear it, amen, and it comes up in a red. Have you ever noticed that when the red hot revivals, we like to say when red eyed rangers are preaching, the red hot revivals are going on, and, and why do we always have to have revivals in the first place? You ever think about that? I mean, I'm just musing here. Bear with me, and I'm, I know I'm just, see, like I'm, I'm teaching about nothing here this morning, but I really am. But, uh, but the whole idea is, you know, we have revivals and we have different things of this nature and we have different thoughts and, and, and things that we're doing. But <laughs> have you ever stopped to think, why do we have to have a revival? What? You ever, you ever just, you know, revival. It's like, does people just live dead all the time? That you need a revival, constantly needing revival? Because the reason we need revivals is because what begins to happen is there are some folks that are praying, but a whole lot more than aren't. That's why we need revival. It's not, can I tell you who the revival's for? It's usually not for the folks that need the revival, it's for the folks that don't need the revival. That's right. So they don't get weary in well doing. Because the people that need the preaching that you usually receive from a revival never show up for it anyway. Does that sound harsh? I don't mean it to be. I'm just, that's just something I've noticed over the years. I said, you know, how many, uh, brother, well, I don't want to get you in trouble, so I'll leave you out of this. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard, a, so, and you know the situation might be going on or something. I wish so and so was there to hear that tonight. Anybody, anybody, any takers on that? I wish so and so was there to hear that. It really got them good. As if we're looking to get people. I'll show you. I can really preach on your sin, buddy. Well, okay, we can preach on yours too. Right? It's okay when we preach on somebody else. That's because I, I don't know if anyone's ever noticed this before or not. But there's a reason because sin responds to the preaching of the Word. It responds. It gets scared. It gets uncomfortable. Have you ever noticed when really good preaching is going forth? And you can always tell when the sinner's in the house because they're grabbing somebody's baby. Give me a baby. Something to hold on to. Something. So I ain't got to hear. So I ain't got to think. Or they're running to the bathroom. That's when you know you got them going. That's when you know you're hitting home. Is when they start taking off to the bathroom and grabbing babies or find a reason to go out and have a cigarette. That's when you know you're hitting home. But that's good. That's what you want to do. You don't want people to ever become comfortable with sin. You can't ever get comfortable with sin. Don't ever let it sit in your backyard. That's even when it walks in the door. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, when something's walking through the door of your church, you know, it could be uh, 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 homosexuality. It could be, you know, a spirit of this, this type of thing. You have to preach at it. You don't have to preach to the people, but you have to preach at it. Because if you allow that spirit to take a rest or take up residence, it will be pervasive throughout the whole church. And you'll find people, you know how I know this to be true? It's this real simple stuff, folks. This ain't even hard. Me and Michelle at our home, we can always tell when we're dealing with, 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 with someone's been in our home. You know how we know? Because it'll happen to us that night. We'll be dealing with some spirit in the house that night who's ever been in our home that doesn't know God. Because we, we, you know, we've dealt with the foster parenting system and we've dealt with a lot of that stuff. And so we've had people in our home from social workers to different type of people all the time in our house. And we can tell you what kind of spirit they're of and everything. I'm going to be honest with you. We've had, you know, we, we've dealt with, <laughs> you know, Noah, I don't want to get into too deep of detail of this stuff, okay, because I don't want to tell on people. But, you know, we've had, I can't tell you, I keep a good bottle of oil around the house. I'm slathering things all the time. And if I ain't slathering, Michelle's look, you need to slather the house again. Even if I don't feel like doing it, says you're going to do it anyway. Says you need to go go anoint these door frames again. Go go anoint this house. And some of y'all may think this stuff's crazy, but y'all need to do it more often than what you do. Anoint you, you might find you got a lot less turmoil in your household if you will pray, because you're dealing. Because the, let me tell you something: the enemy knows, amen, when you're a child of God, and it's uncomfortable around you, whether you know that or not. It's uncomfortable around you, so it can do one of two things: it will try to dominate you. Or it'll run away from you. It won't, it'll do one or two things. It'll try to dominate. It'll have to dominate the conversation, especially that's why the Bible says two or more gathered together in His name. He's in the midst of every touch green anything you want. It shall be done, right? One will chase a thousand to flight. Two will chase what? Ten thousand to flight, right? That's why when you're in a room full of sinners, 
Amen. And you're the only one there. It's okay and it's easy for them to talk dirty jokes and they make you leave. Because you're not always going to win that battle. I'm sorry, you're just not. Sometimes you've got to be like Joseph, take your jacket and run. Or let them take your jacket and you go run. Amen. But there are times when there's two or more of you, you could dominate a conversation. You could dominate a conversation. Why? Because there's two of you. Amen. Unless this person's got just thousands of thousands upon thousands of devils dealer dealing with, amen, in their life, praise God. Because you really don't know what people are dealing with until you start talking to them and start dealing with them. That's why it's so vital we get into the Word of God and get instruction and teaching. But preaching, what it does is it makes this stuff uncomfortable. It makes this stuff get up and run out of the room. It makes it stuff, you know, that's why Ezekiel's four-faced man, uh, you know, it, it, it talks about him, uh, the features of a preacher creature. He had, he had a, a face of an eagle, one side of it had the face of an eagle, which really talks about the encampment of Israel and how they had flags around the camp. But they had the face of an eagle, one had the face of a man, one had the face of a, I believe it was a lion, and one had the face of a uh, calf, a bull. Amen. Now, it, and it all speaks to what happens in the church service, with, especially with a preacher when he's preaching the Word of God. Because when the preaching goes forth, amen, sometimes, amen, he is dealing with, as a sacrifice. In other words, he's the bull, he's the ram up there, because it speaks to Jesus Christ, all this stuff does, amen. Sometimes he's the bull, amen, he's, he's, he's giving a sacrificial part of himself. He's literally sacrificing himself to you, amen. In other words, he's, he's giving you everything he's got. He's preaching his guts out. He has studied. He has prayed. He's fasted. He's done all these things for preparation just to preach that night. And we sit there and get our electronics out like it doesn't really matter. Right? Did that hurt? I'm sorry. That's what it's supposed to do. Because why? Because it's meant to say, you know what? It matters what these guys are doing up here when they're preaching and they're teaching. Amen? Because they're doing all this stuff for you. It's not... They don't just find some internet thing to grab and pull it off and run with it and preach it. You pray about this stuff. You're doing all of these things, right? And then all of a sudden, he goes from this, this face of a, of a bull to now all of a sudden he's the face of a lion. Why? Because he's roaring out of a pulpit preaching against sin. Even he has to preach against sin. He has to preach against sin. You can't, preach, you can't love sin. You have to hate sin. You can't love sin. Sin something you have to hate. No, there's a difference. I, you know, there's a difference between love and hate, folks. Hate's not such a bad thing. You can hate sin. Amen. When something becomes detestable, you you got to learn to detest something. You know, when I used to be an alcoholic, I detest alcohol now. I literally detest it. I hate it. I don't like the look of it. I don't like people even talking about it. Brother, care less. Brother. Let's move on. Let's move on. Because when you learn to hate somebody, it, just like a relate, and I know this sounds harsh, and bear with me, but there may be a relationship that's gone sour. And you may have a hard time breaking away from that individual until you learn to hate them for a while. That hate helps you break away. I hate to say that, and I know it sounds awful, but when that breakaway finally occurs, then you can love again. Do you understand? Because there's a place, amen, where you have to learn to turn away from it because love will constantly draw you to it. Love, love has a drawing magnetic factor to it. Love makes, draws you to people. Love will draw you to things where hate will push you away from things. Amen. That's why it's so important, you know, that we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. You understand that? You still got to love the person, but you got to hate the sin. You can't, you can't tolerate the sin and say, "Well, it's okay." It's not okay. It's not okay. Don't ever tell somebody it's okay to go on and drink or put it in their body. It's not okay. You can't ever tell them it's okay. It's, it's, it's okay to fall, and make a mistake, but it ain't okay to do it. It just ain't okay. It doesn't make it right. I don't want you to ever get comfortable in sinning. But then you go from, from this, this lion, amen, to all of a sudden you get the face of a man because you've got to realize he's just a man. Just a man. At the end of the day, still got feelings like you got feelings. Still, you know, a human being like you're a human being. Still has faults and failures and mistakes that can be made. Come on. But Jesus didn't, but we do. Right? I, y'all ever made a mistake? I get about, what, 20 a day, Michelle, that you give me before you start getting mad at me? And I usually get about 19 and a half on a daily basis. You know, it's, it's easy to make a mistake. You've got to remember folks are, are still men, and we're not perfect. We make mistakes. Sometimes make the wrong call, and then you have to realize you learn from your mistake, and you don't do it again that way. That's all. You know, 
But finally, there's that eagle. You know, that eagle is that place where the preaching of the Word, it goes forward and you, man, it takes you to heights unknown, amen, because, it, you know, I remember Jerry Jones was preaching a message once, and I'll never forget this, and he called the message more than angels. I've never forgotten that message. And I literally felt like I was being raptured out of my seat. Literally, spiritually, I, 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 I mean, there was something in my spirit as he was preaching. It just brought me to a place where I was just like, oh, my God, the way. You know, I mean, it was just so powerful the way the Word of God was going forth, you know. And there are places where, you know, uh, uh, when, it's, when it's Wednesday night or Sunday morning and it's zero degrees and you, and you like to shiver to death and, you, you know, you're, you, you know it's, you got up this morning, it was all you could do to get dressed because it's so cold in the house, you know, that morning, wintertime cold and, you got wood floors and on bare feet on wood floors and your feet are cold. And, oh, that's how it was at my house this morning. I like to froze to death this morning. I put my bare feet on the cold wood floors. It's great in the summertime. In the wintertime, you don't want no part of it. I put my feet on the floor and I thought, man, I want to go back to bed. Michelle looked at me and said, you got to go whether you like it or not. Man. So, you know, but... but, but the whole thing is that, you know, but sometimes, you know, uh, the preaching of the Word will take you to places sometimes, amen, where you can, uh, you know, it's Wednesday night and it's, and, it's, and it's cold and miserable on Wednesday night and folks are just getting out and they're exhausted and they can barely get out of their chairs and you're telling them to worship and praise God. Come on, let's worship God. Let's praise God. They just worked the shift at work and they're, you know what I mean, they had a, a biscuit running through the house trying to get ready for church and they're, they came, you know, house of God, and all they could do, and they're, they're running to the door, and it's five minutes to go, and they're, whoo, boom. We know, we get it. Trust me, we get it. It's not always easy. And sometimes these song leaders act like they're, they're trying to. T- because they're trying to get you to a place where you're that eagle. It says, if I can just get you one or two songs in, if that's what it takes tonight. Amen. As long as we can get you there, that's what, as long as we can get you to that place, that's what's important. We need to somehow still, we still got to worship. We still got to praise God in the midst of no matter how tired we are, we got to worship God. We have to. Why? Because what did I, what did I just get done talk to, talking to you about Wednesday night? Praise waits on who? Zion. Praise waits in Zion for him. In other words, he should be awaiting our praise. Not looking for it, but waiting on it. Come on. Come on. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's praise God. Let's praise Him. Because you'll never fully get into the most holy place until you pass through praise. You'll never get there. Until you pass the altar of incense, you never walk into the place where God can meet your need. What? That's right. You have to pass through praise. Because he's not going to let the stench of your flesh come into his presence. You've got to be covered with those 11 different spices and herbs, amen, that are placed upon that altar of incense to bring off a sweet-smelling savor to him. When you walk through that, that's how you do that. That's why the Bible says praise is comely for the upright. What does that word comely mean? It makes you good-looking. That's what it means. I mean, nobody here gets called comely anymore. You know what I mean? She's really comely. You know what I mean? I, you know, I, I, I've been called comely by you in a while, Michelle. I haven't called you comely in a while either. I know. I apologize for that. I should call you comely more often. Amen. But I'll just call you beautiful if that's okay. The Bible says praise is beautiful for the upright. It's comely for the upright. When you praise God, you never look better to God in your life than when you are praising Him. Do you understand that? That's why praise is so vitally important when we're serving God. We need to praise Him. And I know, and I know sometimes, look, I know physically sometimes it's, you, you don't always, you're not always in the, Full tilt mode, running around the building. You know what I mean? Going back forward with your hair on fire. I get it. Amen. That's 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 for the young folks and and, and even the middle aged folks and sometimes the aging folks when they feel really feel up to it. Amen. But there is a place for raising your hands and for standing, and for clapping your hands. And, you know, and not for getting so comfortable in your pew that you or your seat that you you know that you can't get out of it anymore. Or that we find it turning almost into a recliner instead of what it really is supposed to be. Even a place just to rest yourself while you worship God. You know, we we've, we we talk all the time anymore. I mean, I'm so I'm almost so tired of hearing it about how it used to be. The 
days of yesteryear. The days when people came in. And, you know, because, listen, we need God's help for that. You understand me? For that kind of praise to take place, God has to be pouring out His presence to do that. You understand that? God has to pour out His presence to do that. That you can feel His praise and His anointing. You know, I, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I say, look at David at the end of David's reign. I said, when he was about to die, I said, they, they, sit, they sit a young lady next to him. Uh, and I forgot her name. I want to say it was Abishag. Maybe that's what it was. I think that's what it was. Abishag. And uh, I think it's 2 Kings. You can probably read it. First Kings or 2 Kings chapter 1. Uh, or the First Chronicles. One of the Chronicles of Kings. Maybe the Second Samuel. I don't know. I forgot by now. It's somewhere where David's at. But uh, um, it talks about a lady by the name of Abishag. And the Bible says that they sent her next to David to get him warmth. Because probably his circulation had, you know what I mean, had slowed down and his heart was probably not working like it should. So the blood flow was not working like it should through the body. And all of a sudden, now David was uh, cold. And they tried just to use natural heat to get him warmed up. No other reason than that. And see, I'm concerned that we get to the place in our lives where, amen, the blood's not flowing like it should in a church body. And we start using natural means to try to heat up stuff. And we replace anointing with volume. We just turn up the mics a little bit hotter. You know, and we'll go get smoke machines to, and all this other stuff to have visually studying things to be more visually appealing. But really all you need is just a good old-fashioned dose of the Holy Ghost. It really is. It's all you need is some prayer time, some worship time, and God meeting you in that place time. And you'll find that God always meets the need of praise. I've never seen God fail when someone praises with their whole heart. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've come into this place, and I'm, and I'm, the, I'm look, sometimes I get the face of that man. I am tired sometimes. Sometimes I come in here with an attitude sometimes because I've had a day. Amen. I, and, and, and I don't always have the chance to pray it off of before I get here. I'll be honest with you. So I don't, I'll sit back here and pray before I even come up here because there are times I might not even get into the worship like I should because I haven't had a chance to even pray yet. Amen. But I don't want to go up there without praying. At least trying to get, get knock off some of the stuff. Amen. Because this place, it's too important when you're behind this pulpit. It's a, it's this place is, listen, folks, this is, this is no laughing matter up here. This is no joking matter here. And I, and I, and I take it, I don't take it with a grain of salt. Amen. But we don't want to take our salvation with a grain of salt either. You don't want to take yourself. You ought to be thankful you got a seat here. I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about a seat serving God. You ought to be thankful you, you're, you're going to be one of those that stand before Him. You ought to be thankful, Amen, that God don't, you know, you know, because the Word of God it becomes real to us, very real, Amen. Matter of fact, we're, we're, we're Bibles that most men will never read, and you're the only Bible some person will ever read. And if you don't do it before them, they, you don't see it before you, if you don't walk right before them, if you, you want to live your life in such a way that's not pleasing to God, amen, and you're just trying to get by on the skin of your teeth because that's really what's taking place and you don't ever want to have a place of self-sacrifice in your life, amen, because I'm going to be honest with you. The anointing oil, the most, of the anointing oil, the one ingredient more than anything else in that anointing oil was myrrh. Myrrh whether you know it or not, was the compound that was given to Jesus, amen, and it was used for the anointing of a dead body, amen. Myrrh was used as an embalming fluid. What? That's right. Anointed folks learn to die. Anointed folks learn to die out to the flesh. Anointed folks, it's a bitter herb. There's a lot of bitterness that comes with the anointing, not through you, but from folks around you. With cinnamon in it. Sometimes it can be sweet. Sometimes it can be on fire. Sometimes it can be good and hot. Sometimes folks are going to disappoint you. Sometimes they're going to hurt your feelings. Sometimes you're going to get frustrated. Sometimes you're going to be bitter. It comes with the territory. But you got to remember that. you got to remember that. Because you can't, let, you can't let it affect your walk with God at the end of the day. 
Because the devil desires to sift you as wheat. And if we never get into this Word of God, and all we take is preaching, and we never get into the teaching of God's Word, or if all we take is teaching but never get into the preaching, you've got to balance this out. Some folks like to just listen to teachers on, 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 on television shows like that's somehow going to get them saved. It doesn't get you saved to have teachers on television shows trying to teach you about personal finance and all that. There's nothing wrong with all that in its place. In its place. There's a place for teaching about finance. It doesn't need to be every week. There's a place to teach folks about certain things. Amen? But I'm going to be honest with you. I, I see more folks teaching them. Don't be the hill of Kentucky Wonder Beans to me. I like what, How's that helping me? Am I taking a psychology class or am I going to church? I, I'm, you know, I'm not saying there's not a place for all this instruction. I'm saying, but the Word of God needs to be in the forefront of all of it. It needs to be in the forefront of all this stuff. Is the Word of God? Amen. You know, when I'm teaching, this is my textbook. The world is not my textbook. This is my textbook. And so teaching needs to come from here. It needs to come from here. And I, I, and I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is. Please learn to get a balance between preaching and teaching because you need it both. You can't have one without the other. You bet, or you'll get off balance. You know, I know folks who don't do nothing but listen to preaching tapes to the blue in the face. I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. They know, they'll tell you all kinds of stuff about their preaching, but yet they can't understand the most basis of teaching. I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, because they'll run from revival to revival to revival to revival to revival, chasing down revivals because it's got a lot of preaching. But when it comes to sitting down, growing up, growing out, helping the church, all of a sudden it becomes a bigger deal. It's harder for them. Because they'd rather chase a revival than be taught anything. Because here's what preaching will do for you. Preaching, because it is a position of dominance, you're trying to dominate sin. Where teaching is a, permit, uh, sorry, a position of vulnerability. Preaching requires you to dominate sin. But teaching makes you vulnerable. Why does teaching make you vulnerable? Because teaching is the most fragile place in your life. Not with preaching. Teaching is the most fragile place in your life. Because you know what teaching does? Teaching makes you think. Preaching makes you react. Teaching makes you think. And sometimes when you're thinking, <laughs> we're harder on ourselves when we're thinking than when we're reacting. The biggest battleground we've got is right between our ears. Brother Smith's always said that, and he's right. It is. It's the biggest battleground we ever faced. And I know I didn't bring up any scriptures for you here today, and I apologize for that. But I just wanted to kind of talk to you about the difference and the importance of getting both in your life. Don't just listen to preaching all day long and never listen to teaching. Listen, I know a lot of good preachers out there who listen to preaching tapes to the blue in the face. And, but they leave the rudiments of basic teaching sometimes, and all of a sudden they get caught up on all these little winds of doctrine to the blue in the face. And, all, and next thing you know, because they don't listen to teaching anymore, they'd rather hear a good preacher than a good teacher. You've got to have both, or you'll get off balance. You know, the devil loves to see. You know, when see, you know what I found out years ago, what they always taught you in boxing? You always punch the guy when he's off balance. That's when you hit him. Not when his foot's solid and he's got solid, but when he's dancing around and he's got his foot still moving and his body's swinging too far to the right. Amen, because that, he's going to be easier to push down that way. Amen. You know, and I... That's what the devil's looking for you. He just looks to get you off balance. See, you say, well, what's being off balance? Brother? Well, there's a lot of ways you can get off balance. I'm going to finish up here real quick. You can get off balance two ways. You can be serving God and get off balance by serving God. Excuse me? Yeah. If you've got too much preaching or too much teaching and not one or the other, and not, you know, you know, because your favorite preacher's not preaching that day, so you, you leave. Or your favorite teacher's not teaching that day, so you leave. Come on. 
We need preaching. We need teaching. And you've got to have a balance of both. And you've got to trust God to give it to you. Right? But if we do that in the natural also, if we get too carnal, we can get off balance by being so carnal that we miss the spiritual. That includes teaching and preaching both. We have to be cautious that we don't get too carnal in our walk with God. Because there comes a place where you think you can know it all and you don't know anything at all. Well, you know. Let's all stand. Like I said, I know I wasn't... I didn't give you a nice little page out on this and kind of regret it a little bit, but I... I've been wanting to teach a little bit on the difference between preaching and teaching. So people understand it. No, there is a difference. You notice when Nicodemus saw Jesus because you're a teacher come from God. Because why? He's getting ready to teach Nicodemus, wasn't he? Right. He taught Nicodemus something. But what did he tell us to do with the gospel? He said, preach the gospel unto every creature. He said, teach the gospel. He said, preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus taught him the concept of being born again of water and the Spirit. But he preached the message of salvation on the day of Pentecost to Peter. So there is a difference between teaching and preaching. And it's important that we gather both. Amen. Let's all bow our heads right now. Father, we love you. Lord, we bless you. And we give you glory and honor and praise today. By your divine hand, we are led here today. And Lord, we pray now, Lord God, for your divine authority, Lord God, to continue to move in this house today. That the power and the presence of your divine spirit begin to move in such a mighty way that you'll keep us on balance, Lord God. Lord, that we have enough preaching, that we have enough teaching, Lord God, in our lives to help us, to lead us, to guide us, to instruct us, Lord God, to keep us in such a way, Lord God, that we always continue to walk forward seeking your face this day. Lord, we pray for all that are here today, and we ask your divine will to be accomplished in each and every one of them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and go get your drink of water or whatever. You know, the Sunday school kids got back a little bit late, so it might be a few extra minutes more than we normally do. Please feel free to go get your drink. Thanks. God bless you.